All right, welcome back everybody. And thank you so much for supporting the DEF COM community and especially the Red Team Village. And without any further ado, I pass it back to Gabriel. Take it away. Hi, doing everyone. This is uh, it's a little different, <laughs> but yeah, this is um, I'm introducing a new tool called Drop Engine. It's a malleable uh, payload creation framework. Um, a bit about me. Won't go on about this for for too long. Uh, but uh, my name is Kate Bryan. I'm a red team operator at SpectreOps. I used to work in a place called uh, Gotham Digital Science, doing security consult consulting. Uh, got my Twitter handle and my my LinkedIn. Uh, uh, Username is actually pretty interesting. It's MS080, um, uh, 16. But. So without further ado, let's just dive right into this. Um, let's talk about initial access payloads. So you know, what are initial access payloads as opposed to like normal payloads? Initial access payloads are typically used uh, to gain access to a system environment. So at the very you know, start of your engagement, it's what you're using um, to, to, to essentially gain your initial foothold. Um, it's, they're pretty simple in design. I mean, it really has like one job, uh, which is to execute an implant or second stage payload. Um, and then from there, you pretty much do everything, you know, all, all your all your secondary endpoint operations happen from that point onwards. Uh, colloquial, colloquially, they're also known as droppers or shellcode runners because uh, they run shellcode. Um, but yeah, you know, while, while, while initial access payloads do have a pretty simple role, uh, there are some obstacles uh, that, that, that you have to face when designing them. So, I mean, um, despite the fact that it's like, you know, they perform a seemingly mundane task, right? They, they just load code in memory and execute it. Um, you know, there are some, some challenges to contend with. The first of which is that, um, you know, during the delivery phase, so you're actually trying to get this payload onto the target machine. Um, usually that's gonna be done via spear, spear phishing. And if, if that's the direction you're going, uh, you know, this, this payload is gonna be exposed to uh, signature-based detections, you know, in the form of mail filters, you know, and, um, stuff that's, that's scanning through the email that you're, you're sending out. Um, it, it also may be exposed to automated behavioral analysis. Uh, so automated sandboxes, essentially what, what they do um, is they take your payload and they, uh, they, they actually execute it in a controlled environment. Uh, the reason why they, they do this is that, uh, um, you know, whereas if you're just looking for, for, for signatures, uh, you're, you're going to get these like brittle signatures, but um, that, that are kind of easy to evade. But in this, in this instance, if you're looking at um, the you know what the program is doing uh, while it's executing, you're actually actually looking at behavior, which is a little a little more difficult to hide. Um, and finally, during the delivery phase, your your payload is going to be downloaded and saved to disk, and you have to do this without triggering AV or you know getting caught by EDR or whatever. Um, so that's the, the the final challenge. And then once you've done that. You have to execute your payload. So the payload is going to be executed from disk. Uh, usually, if it's a, um, if you're, if it's like a phishing payload or something like that. Um, although typically in memory op in memory operations are, are a little better. Um, you know, you, you when you're just one of the challenges of your initial access payload is that you, you can't really start that way. So you have to start from disk a lot of the time, um, and you have to do this without triggering antivirus or or endpoint detection response, aka EDR, um, in Windows environments. You know that you're also going to, you know, application whitelisting is pretty much ubiquitous if you're operating within like an Active Directory environment or dealing with Windows. Um, what this means is that you're going to have to find a way to bypass that, and that usually means relying on something called lib, uh, the concept known as uh, uh, live off the land binaries and scripts or LALAS. Um, essentially, what these are, I mean, they're just like utilities, they're binaries uh, uh, that, that come packaged with the operating system, um, and you know, they're they're Usually just designed to like uh, fulfill some benign role, uh, but you can actually you know, what, what what makes them special is that you they have some functionality that you can essentially leverage to do something that is useful for you as an adversary. So in this case, uh, there are several uh, live off the land binaries and scripts that uh, can be used to um, execute you know payloads in various interesting ways. Uh, you know, so that that's fortunate that you can rely on that. You can use that to 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 bypass. Um, you know, application whitelisting. The problem is that, you know, most of these uh, pretty much restrict you to um, uh, programming languages and execution methods that get filtered through the Windows Common Language Runtime, or CLR. And CLR, if you're going through the CLR, you have to contend with Microsoft's anti-malware scan interface, or AMSI, which just kind of like examines all this stuff that's going through. So, you know, that, that that's an, yet another obstacle that you have to do. So in a lot of ways, 
getting this initial payload working and, and running can be very challenging, despite the fact that you're trying to do something um, that's seemingly simple. It, it, it's almost paradoxical in that way. Um, and finally, I mean, you should assume that your initial access payload is going to be discovered. Uh, that's, that's just a safe assumption to make. Um, so your payload really should be able to withstand manual analysis in the form of threat hunters, reverse engineers, and the like. Um, so with that in mind, all these are, are, none of the, are, these are obstacles that are insurmountable. I mean, there are ways to, to contend with all of this. Um, it, it is a bit of a cat and mouse game, but you know, it's, it, it's something that you can, that you can get around. Um, the problem is that evasion, you know, successful evasion techniques do not last very long. Uh, they have a tendency to get stale. They have a relatively short uh, shelf life. And this is because if you're doing your job right, defenders will eventually, you know, learn from what you're, you are doing as a red teamer and, and write detections <laughs> against whatever TTPs you're using. So, you know, those like really cool new TTPs that you, that you drop, um, you know, if, if you're doing a job right, this will actually improve their security and the, the, they won't work forever. If, if, they're, if you're using the same TTPs for like, you know, years and years, well, you know, you could argue that you're not really improving the security bot, but yeah, that's a whole other thing. But so defenders will eventually catch up to you. And what this means is that your 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 payloads are finite. They, they, have, a, they have a shelf life um, and, and that's good. Um, and, and specific payloads, right? So we were talking about TTPs there, right? But specific payloads that, that you write have an even shorter shelf life because at some point, um, you know, someone's gonna write a signature based detection for that particular, um, you know, assembly that you drop on, 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 on an op or something like that. And, and you know, for, that's relatively easy to do. I mean, from, from relatively, right? I mean, from an adversary's perspective, what this means is that reusing payloads is likely to get you burned. So, you know, this is where, what this means is that initial access payloads are, 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 are typically, you know, kind of a pain point for offensive teams. Um, and that's because, you know, you have all these challenges that you have to overcome. And the ways that you overcome these, the, these obstacles, um, you know, the, the, the methods that you use essentially uh, are, are, are not gonna last. And, and you typically have to write them by hand or at least modify them by hand uh, on a per engage, on an engagement per engagement basis. And, you know, code reuse can be problematic. Um, and there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of, lot of uh, I mean, despite the re relatively simple purpose, we've ever looked at like the source code for, you know, doing like process hollowing in C sharp, you'll see there's a lot of code involved and there's a lot of things that, that can go wrong. Um, so there's, you know, code reuse is a problem. You, you have to do a lot of stuff by hand and there's a lot of moving parts despite the fact that you're trying to do something relatively simple, which is kind of paradoxical. Um, so to kind of contend with this problem, I, I, you know, I was actually just kind of like researching payloads independently, but at some point, you know, I, I, re, I just had the idea to, to work on this, this new tool called Drop Engine. Essentially the, the, the goal of Drop Engine is to address this problem by providing, um, a malleable framework for, for creating shellcode runners. Um, so if you ever used uh, like Cobalt Strike, for example, um, one of the cool one of the things that makes like Cobalt Strike great is the fact that you know just about every aspect of your agent that you're that you're placing on that you're using on 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 the on the target machines that you're operating on um, can be modified. You know you can modify traffic profiles. You can modify um, uh, you know essentially how it how it's you know, dealing with like you know, using name pipes and whatnot. I mean, like just about every aspect of, of, of its use, uh, you, you, you can customize it in some way. And, and by doing that, um, you know, really get a lot of use out of this one tool. Um, so I guess the core idea was to try to do something similar with um, in initial access payloads. And, you know, the core idea is to identify discrete payload components. So the, the, basically like examine, you know, like your typical payload and say, what are all the, 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 the parts that you see in this payload that they kind of repeat themselves um, across every payload that you ever write, and you know identify those and turn them into modules. Um, and as a bonus, provide built-in obfuscation encryption and symbolic substitution capabilities, uh, which makes it easier to evade signature-based detections. And in the case of encryption, um, makes it easier to to, uh, to you know evade human analysts. And and you know by doing that, we we greatly extend the shelf life of, of you know those individual payload components that we're writing. So how would something like this work? Um, to kind of think about this, right? We have to talk about how payloads are built. 
Um, this is this is actually you know the interesting about this project. This is less of a red team uh, project than it is like a software development project because like we're actually not really trying to do a whole lot of crazy stuff here with the, with the actual um, um, the, the payload itself. We're we're just looking at kind of the abstract uh, design pattern here. Um, you know, at, if we if we think about the anatomy of a payload, at their core, initial pay access payloads are, are relatively simple. They involve two major steps, which we talked about. You load the shell code into memory, you need to execute it. Um, a little bit of terminology that I'm going to throw out here. Uh, from this point onward in this, in this presentation, we're going to refer to the routine that performs these two actions as the executor function, uh, just to kind of make things simple. So there are many ways of achieving shell code execution. You know, you've got DLL injection, uh, you can spawn a local thread, uh, you can use process hollowing, thread execution, hijacking, all kinds of stuff. But we actually want to abstract away uh, specific details like this. We don't really want to focus on them quite yet or, or because what we're looking at is actually for more of a, a bigger picture. Um, you know, also something else we need to consider, we mentioned that we need to uh, um, uh, contend with application whitelisting. And that really means that we're limited to formats that can be executed or, um, uh, by, by law boss, you know, you know low level land buyers and scripts. Um, so what this means is that our initial access payload is really gonna require three basic components. And you can kind of see my diagram here on the left here. Uh, we're gonna have the shellcode runner. Technically the whole entire thing is, is a shellcode runner, but well, just for the sake of, of, of labeling things, you know, we'll refer to this outer wrapper as a shellcode runner. That's gonna be law boss specific, right? Um, you know, if it's MS build payload, that's gonna be like an XML file, basically. If it's, if it's an install util payload, that's gonna be a C sharp file that's compiled into an assembly. Um, but you have your outer shell code runner, and then you have your payload main. That's your application entry point that's going to call your executor function and really everything else that gets called within your payload. But we're not going to worry about everything else yet. Um, it's just these three components. And then finally, you have your, your executor function. And this is going to load your shell code into memory, execute it, and you know, give you the, you know, essentially, yeah, that's that's the meat of your of, of this payload so far. So drop engine implements these basic components as base classes. Um, essentially, what I've done is, is I've, I've taken um, these three components and, and, and made it so you can inherit from them and derive modules from them. And what this means is that if so you can just write a module and you can use any executor type you want, wrap it in any shellcode runner you want, and the overall structure of the payload remains the same, despite that you have a lot of different options as to how to actually implement all of this stuff. Um, to kind of give you an example, of, you know, when I'm talking about the structure, you know, this is this is a I, I ripped this direct. Well, there's supposed to be a link to this GitHub, but I guess like it's getting cropped on the bottom um, because it's PowerPoint and Zoom. But yeah, uh, this this is from uh, 0x13 Steve Flores' GitHub. It's it's from a project called MoveKit. This is a and this is just a, an MS build runner, right? And you have um, your outer wrapper, which is what we talked about here, right? And this is just your XML file. You have your payload main, which is just importing stuff and Calling this executor here, and then you have your and then you have your uh, your, your your actual executor function there, your shell could inject. So, and this is this can be interesting. I have to switch back and forth here a little bit. I'm actually going to stop sharing for a second and then reshare from Hyper. Cool. So, yeah, I mean you're going to see a lot of other stuff here, but if you look at the overall structure of of, of how things are done, we have our Payload main components have our you know, runners. You know, we can break them into individual discrete components like that. And we'll, we'll kind of go into more depth in this in a little bit. And then, of course, we have our, our executor functions, which I don't have a whole lot of them in there quite yet, but that's OK. So I'm going to stop this and then attempt to share this again. OK, there we go. And then hit from, from the current slide. OK. So we've identified our, our discrete components here, right? These, uh, th these items here. Um, we also uh, you know, want to um, throw in encryption capabilities. So it, it, it's typically a good idea to uh, leverage encryption when creating initial access payloads um, for, for multiple reasons. Uh, basically, you have your shell code that is going to be executed by your, by your shell code runner. And you know, if it's something you don't necessarily want to, a lot of these are going to be like binary payloads or something like that. Um, and you don't necessarily want to have to throw that whole entire thing out uh, just because the, that particular signature is, is detected by antivirus. So what we do is, you know, 
one way of, of, of evading, of, of hiding that from, you know, signature-based checks is by encrypting it. Um, but the other, the other advantage of encrypting your shellcode is that it makes it more difficult for human analysts to reverse engineer our payload. Um, remember, we need to assume that the payload is eventually going to get caught. And um, when it does, we want to make it as difficult uh, for, for the reverse engineer to pick this apart as humanly possible. Um, what this means is that uh, our updated, our updated uh, payload execution process um, is, is actually going to involve a few more steps. It, we are going to load the encrypted, encrypted payload into memory. Uh, we're going to decrypt that payload using an encryption key to obtain plain, plain text shellcode. And then finally, we're going to load that plain text shellcode into memory and execute it. Um, so the, the, the extra step here that we've added is, is, is this encryption function. Um, so if we're going to use encryption, this introduces yet another um, thing that we have to account for, and that's key storage, derivation, and retrieval. When we leverage encryption to protect our shellcode, um, essentially this is going to require us to provide our payload with one of the following. Um, it's either going to need to be able to derive the encryption key somehow without actually storing it, right? So it's not going to store it, but we need to be able to obtain it, the encryption key somehow. It needs to be able, if we can't do that, um, it, need, it, would, we'll need, it could possibly just retrieve the encryption key from some other location. So we could provide it with that capability. Um, or we could just store the encryption key itself in the payload. Now, obviously, this last option is is not ideal because, you know, if you're storing the encryption key in the shellcode, if someone or in the payload, then someone compromises the payload, then they can decrypt the shellcode, and you're kind of, you're you're just adding an extra step, but you're not really, you know, making it terribly difficult to uh, um, to pick apart. So, um, let's talk about this first option a bit. Right, uh, we mentioned. Uh, um, the use of, uh, uh, you know, the first option is to derive the encryption key. Um, one really great way of doing this is, is uh, the use of environmental keying. Uh, there, this is like a really, I mean, so environmental keying has been around for a pretty long time. I mean, there's a lot. If you just look up like malware, you know, environmental keying and just Google it, uh, there's just tons of papers written about the subject. Um, I think the, the three most um, uh, relevant projects to check out, though, in terms of like prior work that's like really relevant to red teaming, uh, would definitely be, um, well, Ebola is the classic one, you know, job, uh, 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 yeah, that, that's, uh, so if you, if you look up Ebola GitHub, like uh, that, that, that one is going to come up really, and environmental keying, that one will come up. The other one is, uh, is Spotter, that, that one was released fairly recently, I think like in 2018 or something like that. And you know it pretty much you know does something pretty similar, um, and then also there's uh, uh, I think like Leo Lupik has uh, has some uh, blog posts where he talks about this and also expands off of, of, of that, those. But um, yeah, so the idea with environmental keying is that you actually derive the encryption key um, either entirely or in part from values in the environment. Um, so what do we we mean by this? Well, I mean let's say that you know. By, by attributes in the environment, you know, we're talking about usernames. Um, you know, so, so for example, you could you could use uh, the, the currently logged in user that, that your payload is running as um, as part of the encryption key. You could you know try to obtain the external IP address from where your your uh, your, your shell code, your payload is executing, and use that as as part of the encryption key. You could you know use your make sure that you're you're actually on the right computer by by uh, uh, you know, deriving the encryption key in part by using your internal FQDN. Um, I, I actually even like, uh, you, could, you could even like use the moon phase or something like that. I mean, you can, you know, but essentially what this lets you do, um, well, it does two things. Um, one, it makes your, 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 your payload very, very resistant to analysis because your encryption key is now no longer being stored in the payload. And essentially they'd have to, you know, essentially like if you're, if you're setting encryption key to the value of the hard drive serial number, you know, that means that you'll be able to decrypt and execute your payload on a specific machine that has that particular hard drive plugged in. Um, but if you're an analyst and you just have a copy of this of this of this payload, um, unless you know uh, what um, you know what specific machine you're going after and what the serial number is, you're essentially forced to to attempt to crack that the, that encryption by by guessing the value of that serial number. So it's it, 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 makes, it makes your payload super hard to crack. And the added advantage is that it's very targeted. Um, 
your shell code is only going to be decrypted on machines that match the keys specific attributes or if someone sits there brute forcing for a very, very long time. So I'm now going to set the first live demo of this uh, over Zoom, no less. Uh, this is going to be interesting. All right, so <clears throat> I'm going to do a couple things. First, I'm going to show you my setup that I'm using for this. I think that's important. Uh, just so that you, you all know kind of what, what's going on here. So I'm going to stop sharing for one second. And I'm literally going to share. Well, can I do that? OK, actually, yeah. So the first thing I have to show you, security settings on this machine that I'm using, because that's, that's actually very relevant. Uh, and you should see it. Okay, let me, let me try sharing this again. Oh, you know what I can do? Yeah, here it is. Okay, I got it. So as you can see, I don't have cloud delivery protection because I don't want the stuff I'm working on at the moment to get shipped off to antivirus analysis land, essentially. So that that's turned off, um, as well as automatic sample submission. But this is, this is a brand new Windows 10 install. Uh, have real-time protection turned on, uh, tamper protection turned on so you can't disable it. Uh, which, and I also, but I do have an exclusion set up and I wanna, I wanna explain this really fast in case you're, you're wondering uh, why certain things are working. So I have one exclusion here and this is this directory demo A, B include. So essentially what I'm gonna be doing during these demos is I have four and I'm gonna have to now switch windows that I'm sharing again. So you should see hyper right now is four terminals. I'm going to try to make this a little cleaner. So in the top left, this is just for my benefit. That's essentially, I'm, I'm trying not to anger the demo gods. Uh, so I am uh, keeping as much of this stuff in the text file. I'm going to run the commands that are in there rather than trying to just guess. Uh, this, this will be relevant later. This is going to be a remote key server and you can kind of yeah, we'll talk about that in a second. This is a Metasploit instance. So this is, yeah, so we're actually going to use Perturbator for this. So like every AV um, engine under the sun should be able to detect what we're doing, essentially, is what I'm trying to say. We're just using a, the payload we're going to be using is going to be a, just a plain Perturbator reverse HTTPS. Um, and we have to use HTTPS because the actual unencrypted traffic will be picked up immediately. But the, um, so that exclusion that we're seeing is being difficult, I might have to, it's, it's going to be in this directory here, demo AV exclude. And this is because we're going to be building this payload. And although the payload was generated here, you know, the second I SCP that payload over onto, onto my, my main machine, which is, which is what you're seeing in this top right terminal here, um, it, Defender would just nuke that. And I, I really don't want to just keep turning Defender on and off every time I have to do a demo, which is because that's just going to, I'm trying to make this go as like smoothly as possible. Um, so it, the, the the kind of compromise here is that we're going to be pulling our, our actual shellcode out of demo AV exclude. But when you execute it, that's not where we're going to be executing from. We're going to be executing outside of the exclusion folder. Okay, with that out of the way, um, let's, let's show you how to go over Let's go over how we'd make uh, an like a like a, a payload using environmental keying. So essentially, the first thing we're going to do is get a list of available modules, right? And just run this. And these are all the different payload components uh, we can choose from. Um, so let's say that we want to use environmental keying. You know, we want to essentially grab um, uh, the let, let's do the FQDN because I have that written down and. Um, and and, the, and my current username. So like we're going to derive the, the key from that. Um, in that case, you know, we could just do this. We could do uh, Python drop engine. I'm break onto a new line here. Specify that our shell code should be, um, you know, in that AV, or demo AV exclude empty shell. Um, we're going to use. So the, the interface, I'm specifying this command interface, 
that's like literally the glue that holds everything together. You know, if you're working in C sharp, you're gonna use a C sharp interface. Don't worry about that too much. Um, but we're gonna say C sharp runner interface, right? And then we're gonna also look at just like this encryption key. So we so we need an encryption key and a decryption key. Um, so the the e key, keys we're gonna use are gonna be this uh, uh, external X, um, FQDN that we talked about. And notice I'm using more than one. Uh, we'll we'll kind of go into to how that works in a second, right? We're also going to use the decryption keys, which is essentially these things, but written in C sharp. Because you know, we're just going to copy these, put them in there. Um, we're then going to need to select a cryptor to encrypt our shellcode. Um, so we're going to say cryptor. Yes, we're just going to use AES two fifty six. That should really be named AES256, not just AES. I should change that. And we're going to use a decryptor. Uh, so decryptor C sharp, origin doll AES, which is the corresponding decryption function that we need. Finally, for our shell code run, we'll go ahead and use MS build because that will save you from having to compile something, which will take extra, extra time. And then we're going to need a mutator. We haven't really talked about mutators yet, um, but we will. Um, but for now, I'm going to say mutator. And essentially, what that's going to do is going to take all the variable names and in our in our finished output and change them to a random string. So it just makes it a little harder to, to sing it around. And that that really is. Oh, we also need to specify the the, the actual username and external FQDN that we're trying to use for our key. So I'll, I'll put my username well as FQDN, and I'm just going to copy it from here. And hopefully this didn't update in the last time, like in the past hour or so, but I don't think it would have. And finally, oops, all right, I forgot something. We need an executor function. Yeah, so we need that executor function that actually executes our, our, our shell code. And we're just going to use uh, C sharp virtual alloc thread. Uh, so just going to essentially make a call it virtual alloc, virtual protect, and all that. And, Spawn this new thread. And we're going to make our output file example.csproj. That's going to be our, our MS build file. Cool. Looks like it ran. Didn't get any errors. If you look at our example csproj, here is an obfuscated MS build file. Um, actually, I, could, I should probably kind of show you what this is actually doing. I'm going to do mutator null, which basically means don't mutate anything. Um, but yeah, so you know, we basically here are all the different components that the, are stacked together. Here are your decryption keys and your your decryptor and your executor and everything else, right? And then here's your actual payload itself and payload main. Essentially, all this is just being rendered into the payload by Drop Engine uh, automatically. And finally, it runs everything down there. But I want this to be random because I don't know demo gods, I guess. So make that a random one. So now we're going to set up our handler. Use exploit multi handler payload for CTP. L host set L port uh, 443, which should be correct. And I'm going to say exploit j to start our handler in the background. And then we're going to actually run this using MS build. And there we go. Now, just to kind of, in case you don't believe me, like that this is actually doing something. I'm going to kill everything here. You know, that was a bad sign. Oh, whatever. If I copy, how do I enter nano? All right. You know what? I'm actually I'm actually deviating from the demo right now, and I I, I think that's a that's a bad idea. We'll we'll get back to this if we have time. Um, no, actually, you know what? I'm I'm stubborn. Let's let's do the yeah. If I copy demo av exclude empty shell and let's just copy it up one level, we should get an alert. Or perhaps not. Maybe we might have to run it to to get the alert. But yeah, I'm not going to say you're tinkering with this. Um, let's get back to PowerPoint. OK, 
from current slide. So that's our, you know, payload with basically like um, custom built payload with, with environmental keying that we literally just created in like a second. Um, so mutator modules, right? Um, we mentioned also that we're using uh, Would there be, I guess not, okay. Ignore me, I could have sworn there was something else that I was supposed to talk about there. Okay, um, yeah, so like the other thing, essentially what we've just done, I mean, we, we've, we've said, you know, here's here's the execute, um, executor function we wanna use, uh, here's the shellcode runner we wanna use, here's the encryption decryption routines we wanna use. And by the way, we wanna derive our keys from these two specific functions, and we're going to pull this stuff together and make it into a payload, and by the way, randomize all the variables in, in variable names in that payload. And just write a command and then it just does it. And then voila, you have a payload. Um, the way that we did the actual, uh, the, the changing of the variable names was, was using module, basically um, uh, modular symbolic mutation. So Drop Engine supports the use of, of mutator modules that, I mean, essentially what they do is that they, um, every every module that uh, had, you know, corresponds to a, uh, some something that has like variable names or function names has a mutator method that gets called in the back end by whatever mutator module that, um, that you select and the mutator module then systematically goes through and takes like a list of, um, of, of variable names and maps them uh, using some algorithm. Uh, the algorithm is, is irrelevant, just it's, it's module specific. Uh, and then when the, the actual, and, and returns back to that module, the, the original module, um, that mapping, like so like a dictionary of like, here's all your variable names and here's the stuff that we've mapped them to. And then what, what happens is that when you render, when that module gets rendered or it, into, uh, a rendered template, and, and that's how we're building everything. It's using Jinja templates. Um, we are uh, essentially what's going on is that um, it, it looks at that mapping in order to, to figure out uh, what's name the variable. So this is pretty cool because it allows us to create um, payloads that you know are circumvent signature-based detections pretty easily. Uh, I only have like three supported methods in there right now: uh, row 13, <laughs> the random string, and also simple substitution using a word list. No mutator doesn't really count because that's just it just doesn't do anything. It's a null mutator. It, it's primarily there for debugging purposes. And um, I kind of already demonstrated that, but if you want to just go over, you know, just, like, just once again, like what that, that looks like, you know, let's take this one that we just did, just print the screen instead of output file. So for example, here, here's your, actually, let me use, I've got another piece of shellcode that isn't so long that we can use for, for demos. Yeah, so, you know, here's your, your random strings. You know, if you wanted to use uh, root 13, those, these look awful lot like the, the variable names. Let's use a word list. I actually have to specify word list when you do this. Let's use US cities and that will now all your variable names are corresponding to US cities. A better use of this would just be to find like a, make a word list that actually are believable variable names. But um, I don't know, this is, this is better for, for doing a demo. Let me go back to PowerPoint and let's move on from here. And let me just make sure, okay, cool. So let's talk about some more keying uh, techniques that we, we support. Um, we talked about environmental keying. Remote keying, it's also pretty neat. Essentially, instead of uh, deriving the, the key from some place in your environment, uh, you're, you're actually gonna retrieve the encryption key from some remote location, you know, either for HTTP or HTTPS, DNS, or some other uh, communication protocol. Um, this is actually, uh, you know, if you have well-designed non-attributable attack infrastructure, it actually makes this, this uh, method pretty effective. You know, you can, you can place the key server behind a redirector and, 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 and only accept requests for that key under a specific uh, for, for a very specific profile of traffic that's being sent to the redirector. Um, if you want to make it even, even even better, you can use a one-time remote key, which is a variant in which your your your, your key server, which is the server that's hosting these remote keys. Um, and by the way, you, you want to have one key per payload, and Drop Engine does support that. Um, uh, so keys should be unique to the payload that you generate. Um, but essentially, the one-time time remote key variant, um, one, once that, that uh, key is successfully uh, retrieved from the key server, um, 
it, it actually is deleted uh, from, from the key server. So the, the, the key server goes back into its database and just nukes the key. And what this means is that any future requests for that key are either going to be ignored by the key server uh, or, or return some kind of junk data, or you could even at that point respond to, uh, to, to that kind of request by returning a redirect. So you could you know, do what a redirect would do and, and uh, redirect that request to something innocuous, like you know, like remotely hosted jQuery or something. Like, look, it's not, it's just jQuery, right? But so, I mean, there, there are obviously some obvious advantages to doing keying this way. Um, it's very resistant to analysis. Uh, the encryption key is not stored on the payload file, uh, and it, it's hopefully being protected in transit using TLS. Um, it's also less targeted, um, right? You know, and while highly targeted payloads are, are, are good in a lot of cases, sometimes they're not. Sometimes you don't just want to attack the computer of that one person that has that particular hard drive or username. So that's the one, a little more breadth. And in, in this case, you don't have to limit your scope. Um, I mean, you, you should limit your scope regardless, but I, I guess what I'm saying is like the, the scope isn't, you know, implicitly limited, uh, limited by, by your key mechanism at this point. Um, so I'll, I'll, we, I'll show you how this works in drop ends really fast. Um, and I'm going to go back to my screen here, go back to hyper. And so in, in the bottom left, we have this, this what looks like a flask app. It is. It's a really, really basic. Um, I honestly did put a whole lot of time into this because, you know, I was just trying to get the, the, the proof of concept out the door. But um, this is our remote one-time key server. And what we're going to do here, execute a very similar payload. Um, uh, to what we just did, right? Hang on, let me. Yeah. So we're gonna grab this. And this is, you know, as you can see here, well, it just ran. But what we just did, we, we created a, um, a shell code using our, our M2 shell, like our, 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 our interpreter shell um, that's in that M2 shell.bin file. Uh, use pretty much the same attributes we used last time. Uh, the difference here is we actually added some keying components. Um, we added a new key here, which you can see right here. It's uh, the, the eKey one time remote HTTP and the corresponding decryption key, which is their, their dkey remote C sharp OTK HTTP. And, Essentially, what this is doing is it's just providing functions that will attempt to reach out to this server right here that is running in the bottom left to retrieve this encryption key. And it's going to use that by using a specific identifier that's unique to your implant. Uh, so that, you know, essentially what this, this guy down here is going to do is, is look in the database to see if that identifier exists. And if it does, it's going to respond with the, uh, the decryption key and send it back to, to our payload. And then, you know, it'll be deleted from the, the, the database. So subsequent requests just won't be honored. Um, so let's let's run that really fast. We just uh, kind of prep the bottom left here. Make sure we don't have any, any stragglers either in our sessions or. Oh, okay, cool. So we're gonna run our, our handler and gonna rebuild this really fast just to make sure everything looks up to snuff. It does. Um, and we're gonna call it MS build once again. And there we go. And you'll notice here we this, this traffic showed up in, in the Flask app, and, and that is our, um, our our server uh, going back. That is our, our payload retrieving the key, right? Now let's go ahead and oops, let's go ahead and uh, kill this session right here. And the reason why I'm doing that is I want to show you what happens when we, so we've, we've, we've already retrieved that remote key. So what we're going to do now is we're going to just kind of demonstrate um, if, if we happen to, to, to curl for that same value, right? Uh, let's say we do a curl request to uh, 127. And this is running on, on mobile host, so we can just do this. Um, HTTP, one slash slash, we're not using SSL at the moment. And, oh, you know what? We'd actually need the implant ID, wouldn't we? Oh, no, here it is. Yeah, let's, let's grab this implant ID right from here. 
Cool. So we have everything we need to make this work. And you'll see that we don't actually get a response this time because it just it's been cleared. All right. So back to back to our PowerPoint. We've got about 20 minutes left. Open this up for chat on about 10. Let's go back here. Our slide. So um, one thing you'll notice is that we're, we're um, uh, is that we're you know actually using multiple encryption keys here, or, or it seems like it, right? Because we're specifying these different key types and, and combining them to create a, a final encryption key. Um, we're doing this uh, using uh, something that I like to call key stacking, which is the practice. And I'm, this is just a key stacking is just like a label. I'm sure this has been done before, like at any times, because it's, it's really not that uh, complicated. Like it, it, it's pretty simple in practice, um, and we'll see that in a minute. But um, essentially, key stacking is the practice of combining the results of multiple keying methods to create a single combined keys. Uh, so, the, for for example, uh, let's say we have a, we want a key that's combined of uh, uh, four parts, the hard drive serial number, external IP address, a not stored in the payload file, so it's a stored component, and also a one-time key that is retrieved over HTTPS. Uh, well, in that point, we essentially would just make four method calls within our payload um, uh, to, key de to four different key derivation functions concatenate the results together. And you know, by doing that, um, we'd, we'd have one uh, encryption key that was derived from all these different sources. Um, so one advantage of doing this is to give us a little more security. It's, uh, it's difficult to compromise. Um, this advantage is kind of complicated. Uh, if you do this by hand, like it, it's, it's just adding more moving parts uh, to the equation. But you know, once again, since we're using a, a framework, it, it makes it a little, little less complicated. Um, and, you know, essentially, the, what, what makes this possible is, is that we, the actual architecture that we saw uh, at the very beginning, it, it has been updated a little bit. So. Remember, originally we just had that shellcode runner and, and a payload main in there and and, and, and a, a ex executor function. In this case, we still have our shellcode runner. It's our, our outermost wrapper. That's our Lulzbot specific uh, script that contains that encapsulates everything. Um, but we also have our payload main. And um, within that, we now have you see here we all have all these dkey functions. Um, you know, so we have a dkey one, dkey two, all the way through dkey n. It's an arbitrary number of dkey functions. And Essentially, the, the way that this works is, is that um, you know, each key part is extracted from each of these uh, key derivation functions um, and passed to the decryptor function along with the encrypted shellcode. That, that um, combined or stacked key is, is then used to get the plain text shellcode and it's passed to the, uh, the executor. So you know, really, this, it's, it's not too bad. You know, but, and we just did, we already, we already went over key stacking. Um, so let's talk about pre monsters and post modules. And I included uh, the cookie monster here because, like, who doesn't like the cookie monster? Like, like really. Um, so, what are pre modules and post modules? Um, essentially, this is a concept. I mean, there's there's often um, often when you're executing that initial access payload, right? That that, that shellcode within your shellcode runner. There are things that you want to do first um, before you actually start trying to execute your your shellcode. Um, you know, for one thing, you might want to perform sandbox checks. You know, like if you're trying to see if you're in one of those automated sandboxes, um, you you might not want to you, you might want to, to check for some known attributes of the sandboxes, such as certain file paths or or you know number of CPUs or or, or what have you, uh, to actually see if 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 you're in a, you know like a quote unquote real environment or um, or in a, a sandbox. Um, also, we mentioned that this is likely going to be going through the CLR, so you might want to try to bypass AMSI, uh, and that's something that you might want to try to do uh, before you execute uh, your, 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 your shell code. Um, so a pre-module is hard to do. I mean, essentially, they are just um, uh, subroutines that are prepended to everything else in your payload. So you, what Drop Engine lets you do is you can specify you know, any number of pre-modules that you want, and these will just get run before everything else does. Um, you know, so for example, if you want to run a sandbox check and an AMC bypass, you pass those both to, uh, to, to Drop Engine as as pre modules. Um, they then get executed, um, and and then you know once they finish executing, uh, and they are executed in the order that you specify them, by the way, which is pretty cool because you can actually control which order they, they execute in. But once they finish executing, then we execute um, the rest of your shell code here. Uh, so, 
you know, post modules, they're pretty much the opposite thing. Instead of being prepended to the beginning of the payload, uh, we, we append them to, to the end of the payload. So um, that's useful for if there's something that you want to do um, after your, your shell code terminates. You know, so, you know, cleanup routines, uh, log file deletion, modification, um, and, and both pre-modules and po post-modules should be completely modular and mutable, just like the rest of the payload's components. So you can you can mangle all the all the string names and, and variable names and uh, however you want. And so if we're going to demo process of adding pre-modules, here's how you do it. Make this a super fast one. So for example, here, you can see if we want to create a payload that, you know, let's say we want to run a, an, an empty sandbox check for, you know, say like, you know, uh, check to see if we're in a sandbox by, by checking the minimum number of, of USBs that have ever been installed. You know, if you, um, the, let's say we look for, for also file paths that uh, can be alert us to being a fan, uh, that we're in a sandbox. So we do a, a file path, path based sandbox check. And then finally, we want to execute a sand, uh, MG bypass for the MC scan buffer bypass. Um, we can just, you know, append these here as pre-modules. And, oops, ah, that's okay. Should be M2 shell, not shell. Do it just like this. And essentially, um, actually, if you're, if you're curious, what this looks like. I'm not actually going to save this. I'm just going to sprint it to the screen. So I can't, yeah, that's what I want to do. And then I'm, I'm going to use that, that really, really small shell code that I showed you earlier that's easier to read. It should not be from the exclusion folder because that the small shell code is not in the exclusion folder. And you'll see here that, you know, Here your, your your sandbox checks and your AMD bypass, and that's all getting executed up here essentially. So that that all gets done right before uh, you run everything else. So once again, let's uh, you know, run our unspell payload. We're gonna start up our handler, and we created in the last step, so I'm not gonna recreate it. And you see that it runs, so everything just kind of goes swimmingly because we're down in the sandbox. <laughs> um, we go ahead and fill this. PowerPoint, just wrap this up. We kind of did both demos at once, and that's all right. Um, the last thing we're going to talk about is, is you know, essentially how do you create drop engine modules? So the, the goal of the project isn't really to provide pre-baked methods for bypassing AP and EDR. Um, it's, it's really more uh, we, we did provide some example modules, but uh, really, uh, you know, they're, they're not really doing anything new or, or novel. And this is by design because uh, the goal of, of this framework is to enable red teams to actually maximize the value that they get from their individual payloads by converting them into reusable modules. And if you're a defender, this is useful too because you can use this tool to to quickly create large sets of, of sample payloads from which to build a learning strategy. Um, so there are two types of modules that you can build: input modules and output modules. Essentially, input modules are anything that's going in before it hits your payload. So your your encryption function is an input module, uh, and and you know whereas for example your your executor function is going to be an output module. Uh, this is super important. Shout out to uh, to Marcelo uh, by Pleader for because his basically like uh, the the loader that it's using to to build these is, is heavily based off of, uh, of of some of the stuff he's done. Um, so the thing about input modules, they always have to correspond to one or more matching output modules, uh, but they're really relatively simple to, to implement. As you can see here, um, you know what we're doing is we're just inheriting from the, we're, we're building an encryption key module, and we're just inheriting from this base class, um, and then creating a constructor, which is just kind of setting the various attributes associated with this. Um, all the all the argument handling is done on the back end. So you just if you want to pass command line arguments to your module. Just add an add arguments function. If you've ever used arg parse in Python before, it's, it's 
you could just add all these here. It, the, the parser is already initialized by, by one of the parent classes of, of, of your module. So you could just make calls to self.parser.add argument and add all the arguments you want. And that will get parsed automatically, essentially, once the, uh, your, your payload is generated. And then you have your generate routine. And this is essentially, um, well, for encryption keys, it's generate. But depending on the module type you're using, you're going to have your, your function that actually does stuff. Um, output modules, uh, very similar, but even simpler. Uh, so uh, the way the output modules work, uh, this is the actual, uh, these actually get rendered into your payload. Um, they may potentially correspond to an input module. They may not, uh, as in the case of like an executor, for example. Uh, but it's, it's really just a simple two component design. You have a Jinta template and a uh, Python file that stores metadata that is passed into that Jinta template. Uh, you know, so for example, here I've got a list of all my variables and imports and whatnot, and you know that gets passed to the interface and then passed back and then loaded into the template in however format you need it. Um, and then here you just have the path to the, temp the Jinja template they're using. Um, as far as actually like creating these things go, how much time do we actually have? I won't. I won't spend too much time on this. It's just that if you want to create one of these modules, aside from the stuff, I guess what we haven't really shown you is the template. But you know, example here's just an example module. It doesn't really do anything. But you know, see, all that you have to do is just set these attributes, and then you uh, give it a list of interfaces it's compatible with, um, and then any input modules it's compatible with. Give it a list of all the variables in your in your C sharp file or whatever kind of file you're using. Really, it's not limited to C sharp. And then also give it the name of a template and give it a function in class name um, in, in this particular instance. You have to do that. Um, it's not very long. Then, then you have to create a template, right? And so literally, this is the process of creating a template. And I'm going to, I'm actually working on automating this. Um, but that requires, essentially, you need to write something that can parse C Sharp. And you know, that's coming along, but it's not quite done yet. But for now, what you do, if you want to actually turn just a normal uh, C Sharp file into uh, a template that can be understand by, stood by drop engine. You just find all your variables in here and just wrap them in this in this Jinja parameter. So you just say B and then you I use a syntax here. So we've got the variable Nick. We just, we just kind of edit it like that. And then we can do the same thing here with the variable N. Should be our only two variables there. And then we just do that once again over here. So this is going to be painful for longer ones, but it, you know, good news is you only have to do it once in that case. And I am um, working on some some ways to kind of automate a lot of that. Share screen. Back to PowerPoint. And that's pretty much it. Um, I'm going to right, actually. This is a Zoom thing, so I, I don't really know. Uh, that's the location of the, the project on GitHub. If you want to, if you want to check it out. Um, I'm gonna. I think it's supposed to be like a Q and A thing right now, and I, I need to figure out how that works. Uh, so I'm gonna. Yeah, basically, and once again, thank you so much for for your time and for the presentation here. Excellent presentation. So for the Q and A, you can jump into Discord. It's okay. going to be offline, of course. There's a little bit of delay between the stream and and when they can answer. And there's a lot, okay. of, a lot of people actually already talked to, talking about the presentation. So oh, super uh, cool. Kudos. And oh, for, for those of you also that uh, probably just joined, uh, please take a look at all the talks and all the activities that we have in our website. The description should be in the bottom of the stream, right? So in the, the description of the stream, all the links and related material. And also, please join the conversation, as we said, in Discord. So we're going to go in a little break, and the next presentation will start in just a few minutes. Thank you again, Gabriel.